Russian composers have had a long time love affair with the works of William Shakespeare. As early as the 1850s, when Russian music was still essentially a, a new item, uh, Mili Balakirev wrote an overture to King Lear, as well as some music to be played during some of the acts as incidental music. Uh, Tchaikovsky came along and wrote three great symphonic poems inspired by Shakespeare. The very early Romeo and Juliet, coincidentally uh, uh, midwifed by Balakirev, and later on uh, Hamlet and the Tempest. Uh, Prokofiev uh, wrote what is possibly his greatest score when he made a ballet out of Romeo and Juliet. And Dmitry Shostakovich also loved Shakespeare very, very much and wrote uh, two sets of music for Hamlet, uh, earlier incidental music for a stage production and the film music that we're playing on our upcoming concert. And uh, a few years after the film score for Hamlet, he wrote a film score for King Lear. Hamlet was written in the early 1960s, a time when Shostakovich was writing a lot of music that had deeply felt social implications. He was setting the poetry of Yevgeny Yevtushenko, who was looked upon with more than a slightly raised eyebrow by the Soviet authorities uh, for, the, for the ways in which he was tweaking the policies and stances of the Soviet government. Uh, Shostakovich did a setting of his poem, uh, Babi Yar, uh, as the first movement of his, Shostakovich's 13th Symphony. Uh, and so worried was the Soviet government about uh, the implied uh, collusion in the uh, killing of Jews during World War II that they virtually ignored the premiere. A Shostakovich symphony would usually get a big send-off, and in this case it got one paragraph. Shostakovich's 13th Symphony was premiered last night, uh, and that was the extent of the review. Uh, and Shostakovich also did an amazing setting of Yevtushenko's poem, The Execution of Stepan Razin, which I think may be uh, one of the three or four greatest works for chorus and orchestra of the 20th century. In Hamlet, he uh, wrote a score of intense drama. The orchestra has been falling in love with it more and more since the first rehearsal. And uh, the score is a study in contrasts. Uh, as early as the prelude, we have these stabbing chords in the winds and brass, and they're punctuated by blasts on the percussion, uh, particularly on the slapstick or whip, uh, which I can't do when I'm playing the piano, but you have to imagine these chords each punctuated by a... Um, and it's, it's an incredible effect. And then uh, in and around those stabbing chords, we have this tragic theme played by the strings and horns indicating Hamlet himself. I mean, it's just, uh, it, 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 you almost can't play or conduct it because your insides are curdling so deeply. Uh, wonderful, wonderful score. When he writes music for the ghost, for the ghost of Hamlet's father, uh, this is no uh, wispy, ethereal tone painting. This is all out great horror movie music. <laughs> Camille Saint-Saëns was uh, very, very modest about his abilities as a composer in spite of quite a bit of 
fame. Um, he once described himself as first among the second-rate composers. Uh, I think he was being unduly modest. Uh, certainly the best of his works are truly great ones. One need only think of the organ symphony of Danse Macabre, of the wonderful opera Samson and Delilah, to realize that, yes, he was endowed with supreme musical gifts. Um, among those was Melody. Uh, he really had a glorious gift for coming up with uh, tremendously uh, memorable tunes, uh, whether they were um, of a uh, sort of an exotic bent. Didn't know that was one of his, did you? That's from Samson and Delilah. Uh, or in the case of the present violin concerto, uh, number three, um, the second movement is one of the most beguiling tunes he ever wrote. Isn't that lovely? Uh, I made the mistake at one of our first rehearsals of this piece um, of, of mentioning uh, to some of the senior members of the orchestra, that is of roughly my vintage, I said, does anybody remember Mr. Ed? And unfortunately now we can't get past that movement without a bunch of wry smiles lighting up the faces of the old fogies like me. Uh, we have uh, yet another superb soloist for um, this concert, uh, Felicity James, who won our Don Bushell competition last year, is going to be joining us. Uh, I can guarantee you yet another glimpse into the future of the great instrumentalists to come. Stravinsky's Petrushka uh, was the first work by Stravinsky that I ever knew. Uh, it was one of the first pieces of music I ever knew. We had a recording of it in my parents' reel-to-reel uh, -reel tape library from the time I was a very, very small child, uh, one of those cases of love at first hearing. And over the years, my, my affection for it has just uh, kept growing. Uh, this is my second performance of it, but the first time that I performed the original version, which has a larger, more opulent orchestration. Um, Stravinsky had, uh, had just catapulted to overnight success with the Firebird, and he and uh, Diaghilev, the director of the Ballet Russe, for whom the Firebird was written, uh, immediately wanted to think in terms of a successor to the Firebird, and it looked like the Rite of Spring was going to be the next ballet in line. But Stravinsky uh, sidetracked himself. He'd been uh, working on a piece for piano and orchestra and saw in it the balletic possibilities. And when Diaghilev came to Stravinsky's home uh, preparing to hear sketches for the Rite of Spring, uh, Stravinsky said, well, I've, I've been working at this other thing. And they both said, yes, 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 let's, let's translate this into a work for the stage. And Petrushka was born, the story of a, of a poor life-size puppet who's been infused with human feelings and is the the butt of the uh, ill treatment of his boss and of the other puppets. Um, Stravinsky, as he had done in The Firebird, used very, very diatonic music uh, to represent the crowd and more complicated, dissonant, strange music to represent the supernatural elements of the story. Um, for the crowd, he used a lot of Russian folk songs, uh, for example, That's something that we hear in the fourth act when the, uh, the fair at which the puppets perform is uh, in full swing at night and the revelers are, are really going quite happily crazy. Um, Stravinsky also threw in a couple of quotes and I'm not quite sure why he did. I, I don't recall whether he ever came clean as to why he chose these two. But in the third act uh, where the Moor is seen in his room and he and the ballerina engage in a little uh, flirtation, uh, Stravinsky quoted from two waltzes that were very, very popular in the beginning of the 19th century, both of them by Josef Lahner, who was a contemporary of Johann Strauss I, the father of the more famous Johann Strauss Jr. Um, and the first one is from, <clears throat> excuse me, a waltz called Die Schönenbrunner, and it goes something like,
And the other one that he quoted was from uh, two Styrian dances that um, Lanner had written also in Wall's time. <laughs> And these become uh, the background to the rather clumsy flirtation between the Moor and the ballerina. Later, even more strangely, the other uh, thing that's most famous about Petrushka musically is that Stravinsky wanted to indicate uh, the strangeness of Petrushka's appearance, his inner torment, and so he did this by superimposing a C major chord and an F sharp major chord. And by playing them simultaneously, this became known as the Petrushka chord, he got something that's just not quite right. So that superimposition of C major and F sharp major, which are as far apart from one another as two chords can possibly be, is the perfect musical replication of Petrushka's turmoil, his feeling like uh, a total outcast and his eventual heartbreak. <laughs> 